From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. One more corner pocket. Now here's Warchant.com's ass on Hunch of Andy and Corey Clark. Wake up! What is up, everybody? It's Wake Up War Champ presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. Coming up on today's show, wrapping up the spring showcase, the one position we're a little bit concerned about, the one position that we feel really good about, and everything in between, covering and wrapping up all that happened across Seminole Athletics this past weekend, and Michael Langson with the latest on recruiting efforts. Wake Up War Champ presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, Tallahassee, Florida, cptallybar.com, the website, 2475 Appalachian Parkway, Physical address. Go check it out. Lunch specials daily, Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. today. Get a victory burger. Flores A played itself and won. That's how it works out in the spring game. Eight ninety nine dollars half pound all black Angus beef burger with a side dish of your choice. Mmm, tastes delicious. Tomorrow, trivia night. Always awesome things going on over the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. Go check it out. Uh, thanks, everybody, who came to check out the meet and greet on Friday. Uh, real quick, Corey. A uh, quick list of, not a comprehensive list. Uh, but Tyler, uh, JT, who I think is actually yeah. from the Eastlake area, or at least spent a yeah. week going to the high school that I went to, and then he uh, moved away. Harold, FSU 91, That's right. who I don't know his name. I don't want to know your name. I just want to call you FSU 91 for the rest of my life. Blake. I met him, too. He lives in Montana. He does. That's correct. Yeah. Missoula. Missoula, Montana. Northwest Mont- Northwest-ish Montana. I-, I was on the southwest part of the state. Blake, who's a fellow Midtowner, shout out to Blake. Her and her mother, big fans of the program, apparently. Okay. Diane and Bruce living that retired life in Polk County. Uh, yeah. But hanging out. Bruce with a just an absolutely astonishing mustache. Shout out to Bruce. And then Ralph. Not a full list, though. Not a full right. list. But uh, thanks, for everybody, for coming out, checking things out. How was, uh, how was your time at the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill this past weekend, Corey? Uh, it was really good. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, had a good time. Uh, was there for about oh, probably three hours, three and a half hours on uh, on Friday for the meet and greet, mm. and then uh, went o- went over there for a little bit on Saturday after uh, after the spring game, which I'm sure we'll talk about. But yeah, we always appreciate it. And if I didn't uh, if I didn't get to say hey to you uh, at Corner Pocket, what's wrong with you? Uh, come come up and introduce yourself. But we we really do appreciate everyone that comes out and wants to say hello. Also saw Eric Angel out there. By the way, when I said Ralph without any energy, I, I really wish I could rewind it. I could rewind it, re-record it, but I'm not going to. But our guy from Hawaii, Aloha, how's it, guys? Uh, just popping in, watching the spring game. It was awesome to see him. Apparently, he's already got his Dublin trip planned out. So uh, shout out to him. Always awesome to see Ralph joining us from Hawaii. Tallahassee native, but uh, out there in the islands now. And so. uh, Bill Fredericks with his dog. Oh, was he there? Yeah, he was there for a little nice. bit. He, uh, he talked to uh, Ira when Ira when Ira showed up. Yeah, Ira was busy at the moon, warming yeah. up, opening act for Mike Norvell, setting the stage on fire. But not like Great White, you know, just like energizing <laughs> hey, man, the crowd. Too, way too soon <laughs> for that show. Yikes. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, let's get to the football game. Sure. Headline from Corey Clark. Lead columnist, lead writer, senior writer. Some bad, but mostly signs of promise during spring showcase. Mm. That was your takeaway, huh? Yeah, I, I, I it was a, it was kind of. Don't you think it was just what we had seen? I thought DJ wasn't as sharp as he had been, but other than that, it, it's kind of what we what we seen. The running the running game made some plays, uh, hit some plays, um, and you know they 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 hit some passes. They missed a couple. They dropped a huge one. Two really, um, it just kind of seemed like it was what we'd been seeing all spring. What was which the is a good one? team with some with some flaws? I remember one early, like on a fifteen yard throw over the middle. But I don't. Re- you guys said like Darion drop one. I only remember Darion catching one. No, he had one in the end zone at the goal line that uh, Edwin Joseph I think broke up, mm-hmm. like went around him. But it's also a play where don't let him break that up. It's not a drop. But it's a ball that needs to be caught. If you're okay. a division, if you're a receiver at Florida State, trying to score a touchdown in a game, don't let the cornerback come around you like that so easily and knock the ball away. Go up there and snatch it and grab it. Uh, and I thought he could have made that play. I think he thinks he could make that play and he didn't. But the big one was Portier uh, because it was what what I hated about it is because the offense had already had two possessions where it didn't do much. DJ hadn't completed a pass, 
And then Dor- Norvell dials up a great play, or Atkins, whoever dialed it up. It's a great play. Portier's running free 15 yards past the line of scrimmage with nobody near him. And if he catches it and turns up field, there is a good chance it's probably going to be a 75-yard touchdown. There's only one defender on that side of the field, and he's running with a receiver. So as long as that can receiver can get in the way or peer, Portier can make somebody miss, it's a touchdown. And he dropped it. That's the stuff that can't happen because, again, when your offense is struggling, you know what I mean? Like that's when you got to make that play. That's When you're up 31-6, to six, go ahead and drop that. All right, man, you'll get them the next time. But when your offense hasn't done well the first two series, or maybe let's say your quarterback, the first team offense hadn't done well, I, I wanted him to catch that. He came back and made a nice catch on the sideline. Yeah, uh, I just I wish he. I think that's a seventy-five yard touchdown if he catches it. All right, all right. Yeah, I mean, I I felt like DJ had been playing his best football this these last you know four practices or so, mainly ever since Brock went down. Weirdly enough, and yeah, I don't I don't think we saw the best of him, or at least we didn't see the best that we had seen from him this spring out there in that football field. So the what gave me some concern is that I'm sure. The reason why Dabo continually circled the wagons around that kid was because he probably practiced really well, I'm sure. You know, I'm sure he wasn't struggling in practice and then not putting it together in games and then getting votes of confidence over and over from his coach. Um, but then I kind of tell myself, well, you know, he played pretty good at Oregon State, you know, last year, helped them win 10 games. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, maybe I need to walk that one back a little bit. But um, yeah, I, I don't. You know, I'm not too concerned about it, but I feel that the trepidation and the anxiety from the message boards, a lot of people, um, you know, I guess maybe thought things were going to keep rolling and, you know, Jordan Travis, ah, whatever, big, big, strong guy, we'll be fine. And now they're kind of like, well, okay, this, I'm a little bit nervous. And it's like, well, to be expected, I feel like. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it can illuminate the fact that, yeah, Keon, Johnny, Trey, Jaheim, and Tr- Jordan Travis aren't on the team anymore. Um, but I, I think, again, I, I, um, I, I just think that the, the thing that bothered me about DJ on Saturday, the thing that we hadn't seen, look, he's not going to be a kid that when the day, the game is over, he's 24 of 29. I so I don't think he's that quarterback. I don't think he's ever been that quarterback. He can be 19 of 29 for 248 and two touchdowns, and that'll be plenty good enough, or it could be. But uh, it was a couple of throws that, that he missed. Uh, the one to Ja'Kai, um, I guess I don't know the second quarter. I don't know. I don't know how they how, did. They keep score. I guess they didn't. It just no. said zero zero the whole time on yeah. the scoreboard. We, we didn't know the quarter. We didn't know any yeah. of that sort of stuff. So, so he had a play where Jakai's open down the sideline, the right sideline, and he's rolling to his right, and he just underthrows him. And it's like a twenty-five yard throw, and he underthrows him by like four yards. Jakai has to stop, come back, and dive for the oh, ball. Yeah, yeah. And if he puts it on him, again, it's one of those things where you get the ball to a playmaker in space like Jakai, it's at least going to be a 30-yard gain. It might go for a touchdown if you make somebody miss. That's the beauty of this offense. Those are the throws you just don't want him to miss. And I don't think he missed a lot of them. That was one that he missed. You, When you, look at the, when you go back, I think, and look at the tape with the decisions and the throws, there weren't a lot – where you're like, golly, man, that's just inaccuracy. There were a couple, but not many. That was one of them. I think there was another one maybe to uh, e. Morlock or Brian Courtney or something. that It seemed like he threw it the wrong direction. I don't know if he ran the wrong route or if it was just an inaccurate throw. But, you know, so he had a couple of inaccurate throws where just put that on him. That's, that's, a, that's a well-designed play that's a first down. And I want to reiterate, he has been doing that in practice. He's looked better than that in practice, and I know you guys can say, oh, well, it doesn't matter what he does in practice. Well, I don't think DJ was uh, you know, overwhelmed or flummoxed by playing in a spring game in front of 18,000 people. This is a guy that's played in front of 80,000 people many times in huge games as a top-five team in the country. It wasn't like – I don't think it was just the pressure that got to him. Like, he's not a guy that – I don't think he's a guy like you were alluding to that just can't perform when it matters, but he's great in practice. I mean, he's performed when it matters. He has not been a great college quarterback, but he's not been awful either, and he was good at Oregon State. So I don't – I just think he wasn't sharp, but that doesn't mean he's not a sharp quarterback. But the thing that – getting back to the negative, the thing that bothered me more than anything that we hadn't seen a lot of is just two or three balls, and it's like, man, that's – that's that should have been picked. Like, let's be a little more cautious with the football. Um, let's not have Marvin Jones, who made a great play, by the way. 
Let's not have him almost cut in front and intercept a pass on third and ten, which it only would have gotten five yards anyway. Let's not let's not do that. Let's not have Azaria could have had one on a deflection. DJ Lundy, if he's not standing up and waving incomplete, um, would have been an interception. You know, well, he, didn't, he, he didn't want to shake DJ's confidence. He just wanted to get the PBU. He didn't want to be greedy. You know? I, hey, and he's another DJ, and DJs love yeah, DJs. Yeah, I get it. Right. Uh, speaking of, Corner Pocket had a DJ on Saturday night. No kidding. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Yep. So what was uh, he spinning? Like that uh, happened. Classic rock. Uh, well, or he, he, uh, dance he, stuff? He, 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 little Lucky Star by Madonna. I remember Ooh, that one. Okay. Um, strawberry Thanks for the wine. text, man. Thanks for the heads up. Uh, well, there was some. Uh, yeah, Strawberry Wine, and then you know there was some more. Uh, you know, more recent music, I guess, uh, interspersed in that. But uh, so, so yeah, I thought that the the throw that DJ Lundy, by the way, great play, really good play. I, I need you to go ahead and pick that off, DJ. That ball's landing right at your feet as you're standing up and celebrating. But I didn't like that throw by by uh, the other DJ, and then the other two that were almost intercepted. Just you know that, that he put the ball in danger a little too much for my taste. Um, but again, he hadn't been doing that a lot in practice. And I just think, you know, I, I just think it might have just been an okay. It wasn't a great day. It wasn't a horrible day. It was an okay day. But I think he's had more good days than bad ones, right? Oh, for sure. So yeah. that's what I'm going to take into account. That's what I'm going to, you know, hold on to is that DJ had a good spring. He just didn't have a good spring game. Yeah, again, to your point about him being a established quarterback, I think he's, he's probably an above average college quarterback, you know, and – Guess what? I, I think above average quarterbacks look lost a few times during a game. Yeah. Just Jordan would only have those really rare moments, like the the one throw against LSU, like in the first half, I think, where right. he just, you know, looked absolutely flustered and just threw something in, into traffic. And I was like, well, that's very unbecoming of him. We don't see that often. But otherwise, it was very few and far between. But we don't we don't go that far back, and I know we don't want to go back to where Florida State was before Mike Norvell and, and Jordan Travis got everything clicking and, and whatnot. But man, college quarterbacks do this, you know. So like that, maybe that's why I wasn't as bothered by it. And I guess maybe I, I prepared myself for the fact that there there was going to be some hairy moments, and, and you know, again, I mean, maybe some credit to the defense as well, like Marvin Jones dropping back in zone coverage, like creeping back. Uh, you know, that was really nice uh, movement on him. So, um, again, I'm not too bothered by it. But, um, you know, 14 of 29 for 175, probably not going to cut it. Though. Unofficially. 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 Yeah, that, that's yeah. Not, uh, not ideally what you want for your, your sort of coming out party. But the coming out party is going to be in front of a much bigger crowd elsewhere than, you know. But here's what, what I wonder, Aslan. Uh, not that I'm driving the show. Yeah. Um, please do so. Uh, you know, we don't know the extent of Malik Benson's, Benson's injury. I mm. think you guys saw, if you watched it, what he brings to the table. He's He is the, their best receiver. Don't know the extent of Destin Hill's injury, but obviously he didn't play. Uh, McCoy didn't play. All the and, and also the portal's open. So a position that I thought was had a chance to be a, uh, a positive and a good position, now there's a lot of uh, question marks surrounding it. And the portal's open for another what week? Yeah, eight about, days. Yeah, uh, do they go get someone? Do they need to go get someone? If Malik Ben, I guess if they go after somebody, maybe that implicitly tells us Malik Benson's status because you know that one catch that he did make over Fentrell, which Fentrell was in phase, was on his hip, was yeah, absolutely great coverage. Like that's what great wide receivers do, and they had a couple of those guys. They had a couple. We don't know if they even have one of them, uh, but Benson showed it in that moment, had started showing it in practice. Um, it, it's a huge loss if he's not going to be able to to be 100% when the season starts uh, because who knows if you know what, what the injury is and then the prognosis, and then obviously I'm the guy, kind of guy that usually wants to give these guys whatever you tell me, oh, he'll be fine You know, four to six weeks. I'm usually like, well, I think probably week seven, week eight is when he'll really be back, but... I kind of think you have to, right? I mean, Matt Lasser kept pointing this out in the press box. Shout out to him. You, Ira, and he uh, were tabulating all these stats the entire day. But he just kept pointing out. He's like, man, only one guy has caught more than two balls today. And then like, he was like, there still hasn't been anybody that's caught more than two passes. I think we counted 13 different receivers. And only it looks like you know nobody caught more than two balls. I don't know if that's, and I don't think that's simply because of the way they rotated guys in core. I just, they don't have a prime time kind of target. And maybe Benson would have been that guy had he not gotten hurt in this uh, showcase. So 
Yes, I think so. Go after a receiver. Don't yeah, force it, we but, should. You know, but we should also reiterate: we it's not like we have inside knowledge or know right. that it was more extensive than it was. Um, it, you know, it didn't look like a knee, uh, so that's good. Uh, you hope it's an just an ankle, and you hope it's an ankle sprain, and uh, and uh, he'll be good to go in a week or two, or much less four months from now when the when the season starts. But I also, you know, looking what they've done through the spring. Um, Portier had an unbelievable spring in 2023. Mm-hmm. Really good. Like, literally, because Johnny didn't practice a ton in the spring last year, um, I, I thought he was their best receiver uh, by a large margin in 2023. That has not been the case this year. Uh, same with Darian Williamson, um, Hakeem. Like, none of, the, none of the guys that you were hoping would step up and, and grab a spot and say, look at me, look how good I've become. I'm undeniable. That has not happened with anyone. No. And that the Jalen Brown kid, too, again, has, has had moments, but you saw that speed on that little end around. But, um, you know, that you just we, – we wondered, you know, I, I wondered before the spring, that was the thing I wanted to watch the most. That's what I thought was going to be the most telling. I felt like I had a pretty good pulse on every other position. We, I wanted to see what the receiver room looked like and how good it was going to be after losing the two dudes they lost. And, you know, it, it it has not been overwhelming. And is this receiver room good enough to win games? Yes, it's as good as the one. It can be as good as the one in 2022, right? Certainly 20. Yeah, I mean, they, they yeah. yeah, you don't have Johnny, but, I mean, you got you, you got guys that can be Pokey and, and Micah and, and those guys, and you've got Ja'Kai, who's good. Um, so you, you, it can be as good as 2022, but nothing about it uh, other than Malik's ascent, uh, you, you know, screamed of something special. And you want to f- you you want it to be or not even special, just good. It's just decent. Not that not it was just decent this spring. And I thought you saw what we saw in the spring game. Just no, nothing really stood out. Uh, nothing incredible. And you know you'd like to have something incredible, so I, uh, it'll be interesting what they do these seven or eight these next seven or eight days. If there's even somebody out there worth getting, but I don't know. You know they're having exit interviews. I'm sure now about what receivers are staying or going. But you know I assume they'll lose a couple. And are any of these young guys? And I'm talking about Hakeem, Vandravius, the freshman. Are any of them ready to come in and contribute? Because I feel like you might have to have that. What's the standard you're using to to kind of gauge the wide receiver core and where they're at right now? Is it last year? Is it just what you think needs to be the the mark to, to get this team into the playoff? Yeah, just to be a, a a good offense. Like I'm not, you know, whether they get a if you if you have a good offense. If you have an elite offense, you're going to be in the playoff. If you have a good offense, you're going to have a chance. Right now, I think they have, they'll be able to run the ball, and I and I do trust that Norvell and Atkins will. They're they're good play callers, and they'll design a a game plan. But it is nice to have dudes that can go make plays when maybe not everything is open. Go make those special plays. You be again. You beat Clemson because of it. Um, I I I I want to see I want to see NFL dudes, man. I want to see guys that have, have have really ascended and gotten better. And we're only in April. But, again, I, I don't know, man. I, it might – this isn't probably fair. But, well, it, I, no, I'll be – I'll mention all three of them because I've already mentioned them. Hakeem, uh, Kintron, and Darian. I didn't see enough out of any of them hmm. to think those guys are ready – those guys are uh, going to be good ACC starting football players. I just didn't see enough out of them. We've seen it in, in spots here or there, but the consistency from any of those three guys just wasn't there. Again, doesn't mean they, they're not good enough to do it, but at some point it, you got to prove it. I was hoping one of them would have a nice day or a big day in the spring game, and no, I don't think Hakeem caught a pass. We had uh, him Kentron, unofficially for one for 11, it looks like. Oh, okay. Uh, Kentron uh, caught one or two maybe. We had him for uh, one for 28. Yeah, and he, and he dropped one that could have gone for 70. And yeah. Darian didn't catch one that could have been a touchdown. And, you know, I'm not taking shots at DJ, but you don't have a Heisman candidate quarterback. So you'd like your receivers to step up. And, the, you know, receivers can make, you know, they're allowed, as I used to always say, 
they're allowed to go make those plays and make a quarterback look better. And you just didn't you didn't see those receivers go and make really good plays on Saturday. And they've had some moments during the spring, but by and large, I would say they have they've just looked pedestrian. Yeah. Not, and and I want to I want to reiterate too, like Hakeem is a second year dude. I I'm not saying that his career is over. Go ahead and hit the portal, son. I think Hakeem has a chance to be awesome. Van Dravia, second year dude. These young guys, Fryer, McCoy, the other Gibson, the other kid that's coming in, they might be awesome. But I'm talking about right now in the present, 2024. What are these guys? Not I'm not I'm not worried about 2025 right now. That's not my job. I'm trying to talk about this upcoming season. This upcoming season, I haven't seen enough uh, to, to so far. I didn't see enough this month to make it seem like they were uh, they were ready to to be big time contributors. I don't want to call it a concern because I don't I don't want to get dramatic here on a Monday, everybody. But what left me wanting a little bit more, or kind of I found a little bit curious, is that we've been telling everybody about the speed of this team. The coaching staff has talked about the speed of this of, of this team out wide, especially the receivers themselves have talked about the speed out wide. The defensive backs have said it, have talked about it. So I guess maybe that should be enough to, to not even really go down this road. But I just on Saturday, I I didn't see any of that. So is it not being able to run polished routes to to get past pretty talented cornerbacks? Um, because I have faith that Mike Norvell will mix in an end around or a jet sweep here and there to, to let a Jalen Brown or a Jalen Lucas display their speed. But man, if, if you can't catch the ball and you're not consistently getting open and it seemed like the, the protection was good enough, was adequate. Um, it, it just, I know there's so many times that we've been in that press box and I've heard you or Ira go, Oh boy, because somebody's broken open and you feel like somebody's about to catch the, is get, get the ball thrown their way. We didn't, it didn't feel like any of that was really going on Saturday. So that was the, the one thing is, we, we've heard so much about the speed. We've seen it, you know, in practice. And, and to not see it out there on, on Saturday was a little bit of a curious kind of development, if you will, for me at least. Yeah, they, they didn't even take any real shots. Uh, Benson's down the sideline, I think, was the longest catch of the day until Van Travius at the end and the, from the from the walk-on quarterback. Um, but, I, you know, I, I I thought they would have aired it out a few more times. Well, no, they did the one time to Benson, and I thought Benson was open. He had gotten a step or two on Cypress. Don't know if he didn't locate the ball well. It would have been like a fifty-yard catch. Was it, it underthrown like it, or overthrown? Because live, it looked. I like thought it was, it was sideways thrown, man. Okay, I, it looked yeah. like it landed right by his feet. Right. I, like it looked like he didn't just see it well, or it was just a little bit out of reach, leading him to the sideline. Um, but yeah, so they tried it once. But I think what people did see is number one, you saw Lucas's speed. Like he's not going to be an eighty. He's not going to score an eighty-yard touchdown every game. But you saw what we're talking about with that speed. And you also saw it with Jalen Brown on his end around. It wasn't utilized in the passing game um, like you'd, you'd like it to. Um, but I don't know if that's what the defense was doing or, or uh, you know. Also, he didn't uh, – when they were going ones for good versus good, uh, he didn't – DJ didn't have a ton of time to throw. But there, were, there wasn't – there weren't a lot of chances to really let something develop downfield. And they didn't roll him out at all to give him a chance. So they didn't – they didn't really take a lot of deep shots. I promise it's there, but you're right. It's like if that's the strength of this wide receiver core, you know your quarterback isn't uh, going to be a guy that, that is the most efficient quarterback in the country. You, you know his strength is his arm um, and the ability to stretch the field. Uh, you know that one of the strengths of your wide receiver core is the speed, and yet we didn't see you try to utilize that a lot. Um, like, like we have – um, in the in this during the spring, so again we know that it's there because we watch them practice. So so they have done it in practice that just for whatever reason did that that mindset or scheming or game planning didn't seem to carry over to uh, Saturday. I wonder what we would feel about this team if we did not get to see spring practice, but we're like most of the fans and all we were go- basing <clears throat> our judgments off of was that showcase. Um, but we we're able to watch practice, everybody. So that's why we're not panicking, and you're not panicking either. You're just. You know, Saturday was maybe not the the most pleasant spring game to watch. And shoot, everybody else was playing a game, and you guys weren't keeping score, so that was even more difficult to kind of judge. But right, uh, we assure you they're they're working in the right direction. Before we do start talking about this defense, which deserves plenty of talk uh, on the on the running game, that the the cool thing I guess with the rushing attack was, I, I just felt like 
Trey was just home runs last year, it felt like. You know, it was the whole yeah. Chris Carter, Buddy Ryan thing. All he does is catch touchdowns. Like All he does is bust off 50-yard runs like in the second half that breaks the back of the opposition. But where are you in the first half, Trey? But like I just thought they would constantly fall forward. This would be an off uh, a running back unit that you know would get you five six yards kind of consistently. Maybe not have that big play uh, pop, if you will. But man, you know, Kaziah Holmes had a big run. Uh, Toe yeah. Philly would have had a you know shoot. They could have he could have caught. He could have ran with that one in from 30, 30 yards on. Probably made it in. Um, Roydell had a nice carry. Uh, so maybe that's it's also going to still be a big play rushing attack, which I did not expect going to the spring and really didn't. You know, I know they popped off some bigger runs, but you know, you figure you do that enough in practice, you're going to get one or two just from the law of averages. But that might actually be a thing for this running attack, like big plays again. Yeah, I I think you know the one thing again that we had talked about all spring, and I'm glad that came to fruition. We weren't we weren't all that in love clearly with what what we saw from the passing game, but that running game was just what we, we were talking about, folks. Like I think we I we ended up it was I'm it's like 29 for 170 or thereabouts were the numbers for the for the just the running backs um th- with, with four different guys I think having carries of at least over 10 yards uh, that's that's what this will be no they they're not other than Jalen Lucas obviously the other three aren't necessarily the same type of home run hitter as Trey Benson but man I really like the way Roy Dell ran uh he's he's a tough runner we see and that's the thing we get to see them run and bust these runs we don't see them try to break tackles yeah. They don't get tackled when we watch them. So this was the first time we got to watch them deal with guys actually trying to bring them to the ground. And I thought uh, I, I was I thought Kaziah had a nice run. In defense, uh, ran, real quick though, Shaheem though, uh, to your point about them not, not having to worry about yeah. break tackles in practice. I think the running backs were ready to start breaking some tackles. I yeah. think the defensive backs were kind of like, oh, this is still practice ish, so we're not going to go full bore. I still think Shaheem lights on. Needs to make that play, makes that tackle on any running back in the country. I just think he didn't, he wasn't ready for what Kaziah was trying to get done. Yeah, but credit to Kaziah to going after him yeah, and knocking him yeah, over. That was a, yeah. was a good run, and and Roy Dell had a couple really nice runs. And I just think again, um, I thought, uh, you know, what DJ did in that aspect was really encouraging. Like the the one touchdown that I think it was Roy Dell's touchdown. The one touchdown that uh, that Roy Dell scored, you know, DJ rode that handoff mm, yeah. as long as you can run one. Like, he, he rode it all the way until the line of scrimmage almost and gave it away. He also had a 10-yard run where it looked like a bubble screen was taken away that would have gone a lot more than 10 yards if, uh, if it was a real game because no way he's going down that easy in the open field one-on-one with a defender and a full head of steam that that size. But so that, that to me – was the the by far the most encouraging part of the game, and it's the one that I thought carried over the most from what we had seen all spring. Mm. Like that was what that's what we've been telling you guys about that the running game looks good. They're busting runs up the middle. Uh, I don't know they're going to have a lot of eighty yard runs, but they're going to have a lot of twenty and thirty yard runs and a lot of first down runs and a lot you know, not even that six yard runs. You know you're right. Last year Trey Benson would have like. You know, again, we're not poo-pooing what he did because he was really good. He's going to be a, a NFL player here later this week. But he had uh, he would have, you know, 12 carries for two yards or less, maybe 14 carries for two yards or less, but then two carries for 100. It felt like this this running back group, and I you look, a lot of that's the offensive line, obviously, uh, maybe being better. But, uh, you know, I... I liked that they they didn't have a lot of plays where they were swallowed up at the line of scrimmage or behind the line of scrimmage. There were a few, but I liked that I like seeing those six yard gains. I love second and four. Second and four is a good place to live, and they didn't do a lot of living there last year. You should do your living at the absolute peak of your performance and capabilities. Do so by taking vitamin energy, y'all. One little shot, not even two ounces, 260 milligrams of all natural caffeine, as well as nutrients to get you through your day and get you in peak performance, whether it's your mood, burning calories, improving your focus, boosting your immune system. Maybe you don't know which one you want to try. Get a variety pack. Then you get another variety pack for free so you can try them all, two of them, so just to make sure, you know, double checking your sources, making sure everything's good. World's first and only clinically tested, clinically proven energy shot to get the energy up, to improve your mood, to improve your focus, and you can get it for free 
by using the promo code WARCHAMPBOGO. Buy one item, get one of equal or lesser value for absolutely free. Again, promo code is WARCHAMPBOGO. I think unofficially, officially, the energy shot of Coachella 2024, Corey, judging oh. by the website. Okay. Um, so if all the cool kids are taking it out there, well, then shoot. You know, we're lucky just to be able to talk about it on our little show. Go to vitaminenergy.com, promo code WARCHAMPBOGO, WARCHAMP, B-O-G-O. Let's talk about this defense, core. Maybe on second thought here now. They were quite disruptive, so maybe we need to have factor that in. I think you probably did. I, I might not have in my judgments of the offense, but yeah, man, Marvin Jones Jr., that's really exciting. Patrick Payton, uh, sparsely used, but you just yeah. know what you got with him. I like the way the DJ looked. Uh, you know, Azari, let's catch those. Let's catch those. Yeah. That's the reason why you play defensive back and not wide receiver. Ha, ha, ha. But, man, just aggressiveness, talent, uh, probably the strength of the team going into the season, I feel like, especially after the way we saw him play in the showcase, if that holds up. You think if they went to Azari and were like, hey, man, we want you to play 20 snaps on offense a game. Would he do it? I mean, you think, obviously, you think he might be our help, uh, the help at wide receiver that we need. I mean, he's well. I was just saying, like that's a that's a rare athlete that did it at a high level in high school. Uh, he was being recruited as a receiver, um, and he might be. That's like getting somebody in the portal, but also like you know, he's his future is at DB, and he's maybe a, got a first round future there. Yeah. So do you risk doing that? But then Travis Hunter's doing it. Yeah. So Azaria could do it. But yeah. Um yeah, I thought overall uh the defense was was impressive. Um like we said that they give up a few runs, more runs than you'd like, but Josh Farmer was in no Josh Farmer was on the sidelines. Um and like Aslan said Peyton didn't play much at all. So, you know, you you have to you have to take it with a grain of salt when they give up big plays that that's not going to be necessarily the defense that's going to be on the field most of the time. Uh, there's a lot of mixing and matching, but overall that's where I think you talk about the speed. There is speed out there, man. There is just mm. th those defensive ends can really move. I think Nicholson and, and Cryer uh, and Lundy, by, by the way, Lundy runs better than he's ever run, but Nicholson and Cryer run really well. Uh, and I just there's speed there. There's probably more speed there than there's been in a good long while. It's just a matter of the depth of the defensive line for me. Is it where it needs to be? to contend for a playoff and get into a playoff. Again, I think maybe one more body or two there. Uh, because, yeah, when, when Josh Farmer isn't playing and he didn't play all spring, uh, and then, you know, your other, your your main backups might not be playing. They might not be at the game, I'm saying. You, you tend to get run on a great a great deal. You tend to give up big plays. So, you know, maybe maybe figure out a way to not have that happen. Uh, but, but uh, yeah, overall, I just think I, I think you saw in a – so it's like a seven-play stretch, Aslan. Where they, so they started the thing with the ball first and ten at the twelve, and I think Marvin Jones on three plays had a tackle behind the line of scrimmage, a first hit near the line of scrimmage, and then pressured DJ into making a throw that was almost interception. I think he almost might have even hit his hand um, on three straight plays. And then the next time he was on the field, that third down play, he cuts in front. He he go he. He acts like he's going to rush. He drops into a, like a zone read coverage and darts in front of the slant on the other side of the field and almost intercepts it and hits him in the face. Like, that's not normal, guys. So it looks like you might have another opposite Patrick Payton. You might not. You might have another uh, uh, pretty special defensive end. Uh, so that's good to see. But, yeah, and I, I just think overall that defense is uh, is good. It might need another player or two. You still have some question marks at linebacker, but I think the defensive line, if it stays healthy, is going to be uh, very hard to block, which will mean that the defense will be one of the better defenses. Because when you have a good defensive line, man, that's that's the whole deal. And I think they will have another. I think they will have another year of having a very good defensive line. Yeah, I'm with you on there. I feel very confident about the defensive line, and I I think you're probably right. Uh, per usual, I. I it feels like at least we're hearing, you know, prospects in the portal that are linebackers at Florida State uh, possibly is going to kick the tires on. At least those prospects are interested in Florida State. But what about what about safety? Love Shaheem. And I don't know if it's because it felt like every time Conrad was making a play, it was 20 yards past the line of scrimmage. Um, but, you know, him and Ashlyn Barker, I don't know if that's maybe where you want to be. I know they, they feel really good 
good about the future for both those guys, but I, I wonder about the present. I mean, t- to you, do you think safety is something uh, that should be addressed or does interior specifically defensive line and linebackers seem to be a little bit head and shoulders beyond what you need at, at safety at this position or at this, I, this point? Again, I think it, it's a matter of like, it's almost like best player available, right? Yeah. Like if there's a really good wide, if you only have one spot left and you have a really good wide receiver, out there, you have a pretty good defensive lineman, you have a starting caliber safety, uh, but not anything special, but has played a couple years. I, you know, I, I don't think, uh, you know, I don't think you go the safety route. I think uh, Conrad Hussey has a chance to be good. Barker does too. Uh, don't tackle Jalen Lucas five yards out of bounds, Conrad. Let's cool it with that. He's too valuable to your team to do that. But uh, otherwise, I just think that, uh, I, I think there's more pressing needs, maybe, unless there's somebody great out there to go get that you just undeniable you can't say no to. But isn't it crazy? Like, just again, the world we live in, where it's like, you know, not everybody is great at every position. There's yeah, no everybody's team. got 11 All Americans out yeah, there. Yeah, no, there's you know. no team in America that's like, well, we're set. All 22 look great. And the guys behind them, like, look great, too. Like, there's always going to be a few question marks or holes that, are, that need to be a little more filled. But it's like, eh. Maybe need a little safety help. What's in the portal? Like, you know what I mean. Like it's just it's like eh, we're not great at wide receiver. Well, let's go get another guy. We're not we we're not we have a ton of depth at defensive line. Let's go get another guy. But that's that's where we are, and that's that's a possibility here this next week. I don't know that safety is a position where you're like absolutely got to go get somebody. Uh, I I like Conrad a good bit last year. I think he's had a pretty good spring, um, and yeah, I think his uh, he he has a chance. Again, we don't know. And that's the thing is, like, do you take the unknown versus the known? Would you rather have a guy that started two years at Arkansas but never graded high, wasn't all that good, but he started, certainly not elite? Or would you rather – you might go through a few growing pains with Conrad or Ashland or whoever wins the job, but by the end of the year, they might be really good. They yeah. might have more potential than the guy from Arkansas. Yeah. But you bring in a guy from Arkansas, and then all of a sudden – well, you might lose the guys that have more potential because they feel like they've been portaled over. So that's the uh, that's the world that Derek Ray and Mike Norvell are living in, trying to figure out this roster. But yeah, you, I mean, you could look at literally every position on the field, Aslan, and be like, well, they could do better than that. Because I don't know, other than maybe Azarie, well, I, I guess Travis Hunter's out there. I don't know that you look at any position on the field and be like, that guy's the best they can get in the country. Maybe Fitz Magic. You don't need another kicker either, but or and Master Mono kicking fifty-seven yeah. yards. But other than that, like there's there's always going to be somebody that's better than the person you got. Yeah, but but defensive end, you're elite. Uh, defensive probably tackle, right? you're probably you were elite last year. We don't know for sure that they're elite, I mean, but we think they're going well, least, to be very good. at least in this conference. You're going to be elite. Maybe not nationally, but maybe just be just outside the big boys. But I think in this conference, there's going to be no other. Peyton and Jones, that's just different, man. I just yeah. don't think that's going to be a lot of that. These teams are going to be seeing. And Lola Hea, too, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. Uh, uh, Nusi? Nusi, I think that's the nickname that we're supposed to call him. We're not supposed to call him, but he, he goes by. So uh, we're going to call it Sione for, for the time being. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll see when with Josh Farmer and Daryl Jackson teaming up, if that can maybe be something or if they get somebody in the portal. But um, like I think they're good enough at linebacker. Like I wouldn't hate if they got the, the kid from Tennessee. Uh, wouldn't be opposed to that, but like I just, if you give me something that's equivalent to what that Elijah Herring, I think is that his name, the kid from Tennessee. Like if you give me something yeah. equivalent to that, like somebody who played Power Five football and led their team in tackles, playing safety, like I would, I'd rather have that than the linebacker improvement. Personally speaking, because I, I think Shaheem's really, really good. So if you can pair him up with somebody that's comparable to his level of talent, what we think he's going to produce at, man, you're you're really, really rock solid because they're going to be they're going to be just fine at court, and they're going to be really good at cornerback too. We don't we don't talk a lot about Fentrell, and I know the the maybe the most impressive play of the game from Saturday was him giving up a, a, a reception, but man, he was perfectly in position to make a play and that Malik Benson just out bettered him. If that's yeah. a, a verb or whatever. So um, I, I think there's plenty of, of great talent, especially on the defensive side of the ball right now. So maybe being a little picky on one to, to get things improved, but I think probably behind interior defensive line, I might actually you know, wide receiver overall, if we're talking about the entire team, uh, because Jake Rizzi's on the way, so the Calvary's coming to help out the offensive yeah. line. Uh, probably give me a receiver after you get a, another guy to help the defensive line out. Okay. And we'll yeah. see how it goes. I don't, I, yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with that, my man. 
Um, anything else on football? We got a lot to talk about here, Corey. Uh, throughout the oh world, no, of yeah, we sports. yeah we we'll, and we got we got to we got to stretch the football out for another mm. three months. Yeah. So let's not let's not uh you know shoot all our our hole in ones on this all on right. this Good. podcast. Good. I was getting a little bit nervous about what we were gonna. Yeah, no, I, I I as soon as I started that phrase, I'm like, don't yeah. don't do that. Hey man, let's start off with tennis. Yeah, shout out to the men's tennis team. Uh, first time in program history, ACC champions. So, I don't know how long Dwayne Hultquist has been here. I feel like it's been it's got to have been twenty years. Um, it's a really cool thing where it, there's a there's a video where they film the last point, and um, which are always cool videos. And the, I don't I apologize. I have not been keeping up with the men's tennis team. I don't know who won the the deciding point. I don't know who the young man is that hits the winner and then crumples to the ground, and his teammates come and rush after him and all pile on him. It's a really cool scene. It always is in team tennis. But behind him, I'm almost positive, you see Hultquist on a knee. Like just kind of – it looks like now he's, a, he's 50 yards in the distance. I'm pretty sure. I mean, I, I my sight's not great. It could be – who knows who it is. But it looks like Hultquist, and he's just like overcome. He's on a knee. And it's like, man, that's – that's why sports is awesome. That's just why sports is awesome. Not not many people care about college tennis, but to the people in that world, what an enormous accomplishment. What a cool accomplishment to be doing it that long and to finally um, get an ACC championship. That's a really neat thing, and I, and, I'm, and I hope he enjoys it. And that was really cool for them to win four matches in four days. I think I read that three of them were against top 11 teams in the country. Mm -hmm. So getting hot at the right time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was uh, that was uh, that that's that's cool for them, and that was a really neat scene. That video, Antoine Corno Chauvonet. Yeah, that's who I said. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, he um, won five straight games to give them and clinch the uh, the ACC wow. championship. Sounds so. like that other kid kind of choked a little bit, huh? I guess that's <laughs> the way I look at things. Losing five straight games in the deciding match, yikes! And uh, Coach Holtquist has been here 23 years. Okay, yeah, yeah. Winning his coach in FSU history. Well, I mean, Lord, he's been here <laughs> over two decades. He better be. Uh, uh, and they've had some nice teams. Uh, yeah. But and also, you might hear that and go, "Golly, man, he's been here twenty. He's been, this is twenty third year, and he hadn't won the ACC yet. And the ACC is loaded mm -hmm. in men's tennis. Uh, so that's it's hard to win. It's like winning at women's soccer. It's it's hard to win men's tennis titles in the ACC. That's all. But so yeah, if you if you guys have seen that on Instagram or Twitter, that that shot. That that video, I, it's cool to see them all mad rush the the kid that won it. What'd you say his name was? Um, let me pull it back up here. Oh, sorry. Cornu Chauvonet. Okay, Probably nice, not. nice. Well yeah. done, Who well knows. done. Coming up clutch when it mattered most. Trying. But then the the coach in the background, kind of like letting it all sink in for a second, being on a knee, like going to a knee. Uh, just a just really cool man because he's given his life to this. Yeah, you know he's given his life to tennis. Years, yeah. yeah. Yeah, to, that's and that's got to be the that's one of the accomplishments of his career, and to see that happen. And again, no, it's not in front of six million people, and it's not an eighty uh, on TV or eighty thousand people in a stadium. But to them, in that moment, that is a huge deal, and that's why again, that's why sports is so fun. It's not at Roland Garros, right? So right. Drop a little Roland Garros uh, reference. All right, so I'm the Western European. Why is that? Are they about to play? Oh, no, just because it was a tennis just, reference. Just, yeah. I got you. Um, I think Corey helps out with the Scandinavian pronunciations. Golf, men's golf, co-champ, individual, Frederick Jetterup. Sure. All right. ah, I thought you. I thought you were all over. No, the I, I, I don't know. Your I don't count. Know. No. Uh, but fault. anyway, so yeah, uh, Florida State also winning uh, all ACC honors when it comes to uh, individual men's golf. So. Well, and I good. think what they did. So check is it they, out, Greg Sankey. Look what's going yeah. on down here, buddy. Yeah. Look what well, every sport, my man. Yeah. Every sport. Yeah. Softball team went on the road and swept Boston Ten College. Ten in a row. Ten in a row. Um, but yeah, you look at uh, the 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 golf team. I think they they do the ACC tournament is I think like the national tournament where they you you have to finish in, I don't know the top four, the top two, whatever it is, and then the last round is match play. So they finished high enough as a team that now they've advanced to match play. But the individual contest is over, and he was the co-champion, which is again, if you're the co-champion individually in the in an in the ACC golf, you can really play. Yeah, softball. They're on a ten-game winning streak now. They are thirty-six and ten after another uh, ACC sweep. Yeah, uh, this time 
It was was it Boston College that got it? Yeah, yeah it was. Boston yeah. College got yeah. the business. Six zero four one ten three this past weekend. That four one game, they were down one nothing going yeah. to the last inning. Yeah. Put so, a four spot on Devin Flaherty, first home run of the year. Yeah. Don't let Lonnie and her team get don't hot. Don't let them y'all. get hot. Don't, don't let them get, get hot. hot. And then uh, don't let my girl Jay Sony do what she's been doing. Mm. She's been crushing the ball. Yeah. I think she hit uh, four home runs this weekend, three Let's or four go. home runs this weekend. Yeah. All right. uh, baseball, meanwhile, entered the week 30-5. and five. Uh, They are yeah. now 31-8. and eight. Yep. So uh, that bummer of a midweek loss to uh, Mercer was not properly cleansed out of our palates uh, after dropping the series to Wake Forest. A little bit of a weird one. They played on Friday and did a doubleheader Saturday and Sunday. Now, they easily could have won all three of these games, uh, but yeah. they did not. They only won the first game of Saturday, nine to six. Uh, Saturday, the, the the back end of that back end, back end. I'm sorry, of that of that doubleheader was just a war of attrition. Who had better arms, and I guess maybe, or who had the less bad arms? Yeah, maybe yeah. that's the way of saying. It. But yeah, so Florida State lost Friday five to four, uh, and then on Saturday they won nine to six, and then lost the the back end of that doubleheader ten to nine on a walk off wild pitch. Yeah, uh, which was every bit as kind of painful as it sounds like. And I know, Corey, we talked about they were fifth going into this weekend in terms of D1 baseball's top eight national seeds. And you're like, well, that's great. But these next two weekends are going to tell us a lot because you're playing Wake and they're going to also play Duke on the road. Duke number seven in the country. I don't know how they did this past weekend. I'll check it out after I let Corey uh, riff here for a little bit. But yeah, I mean, I, I guess if you want to be a cynic, they've, they've only really played two great programs on the road for series and it was wake and it was Clemson and they, they did not win either of those series. Well, they went one and one and four, right? One and five yeah. in those three, in those two series. Yeah. But, but yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, I just, I feel like we know what they have with Jamie Arnold. You feel really good about that. I think Carson Dorsey might be a thing now, yeah. actually, yeah. I mean, you know, it's a really nice, really impressive performance by him. Yeah. And the offense banged out 18 runs in two games in the same day. So that, that's still a potent part of this puzzle and it's April, you know, Still feel good about where they're at. Obviously, let's win the series against Duke to to get a firmer grasp on that top eight national seat because I I want to be in Tallahassee all summer long. Yeah, eighteen runs uh, in in two games. Yeah, this and they could have like they left the bases loaded. Uh, they scored one run with the bases loaded, nobody out, and Tibbs and Ferrer coming up. Um, so they, they, I mean, that was the game they lost, the Saturday night game, where they could have easily, they could have gotten a 13 or 14 runs if, if things had just broken a little differently. They're going to give themselves uh, chances all the time offensively because they're just, again, they're they're stacked. It's a really good offense. I think as highly of them now as I have all season after this weekend. Uh, the kid they faced on Friday night is an unfair college pitcher, throwing 101 with a nasty breaking ball, and they chased him out of the game after five innings. Uh, I think scored three runs on him and uh, and could have had more. And the kid just made a lot of – I mean, he, you got to be great to, to, to kind of shut down this offense, and that kid was uh, when he when it mattered in some, with some big spots. And then they just kind of got unlucky hitting. Um, and they, they got unlucky to lose that Friday night game. That's the one they should have won. Arnold had a, had a horrible error on a bunt. There was another bunt they didn't field with the, the, the two sack bunts where they don't get an out. They're trying to give you outs and you don't get an out. Um, really came back to bite them, and that's that's why they lost that game. But, you know, their, their, their last five road games that they've lost, Aslan, have all been by one run, hmm. um, which the good news is, and I think it is mainly good news, you're, you're there. It's right there. Yeah. The bad news is, is when you have pitching that you can't rely on down the stretch, especially away from home in the late innings, well, you have a tendency to give away runs that you shouldn't give away. Uh, what was so maddening about the second game on Saturday was I think Wake Forest tied the game with three runs. Maybe they had – no, they were down 5-1. to one, And you let them right back in the game with an inning in which you walked four guys and hit three other ones. Hmm. I mean, what, what are we doing, man? Yeah. So, But what, what we have to re- remember when it comes to that is like, yeah, the, the bullpen was a disaster in Winston-Salem – just like it was in Clemson. But against Clemson, my man Cam Leiter pitched two innings, right? Maybe. And got knocked out of the game. And then they had a doubleheader, and the bullpen was a wreck by the end of it, clearly. Well, the same thing happened this weekend. Cam Leiter didn't pitch at all. And then you also had a doubleheader. So, again, Hultz can't pitch. They didn't bring Hultz back out to pitch again because he pitched in the first game. And I think right now he might be your most reliable bullpen guy. But so they can't get a break with the scheduling either. Like yeah. n- there's never just a normal Friday, Saturday, Sunday weekend with this team. There just isn't. 
Clemson, two on Sunday, two on Saturday, one on Sunday. This one, one on Friday, two on Saturday. The two weekends before were Thursday, Friday, Saturday. They just can't get on a normal run. And I think when you look at this team, if Cam Leiter comes back, and you think you've found something in Dorsey. And Ben Barrett, too. Let's, he's a, so, potentially if you get something. those two guys back, what does this team look like in June? Because you know you got, you've got one of the better starting pitchers in the country uh, with Jamie Arnold, and you've got one of the best offenses in the country, period. If Cam Leiter can be the guy that we think he can be, he's not, he's not Jamie Arnold, but if he can be a six-inning, two-run guy, six-inning, three-run guy, Come on now, with that offense, you're going to win most series with Cam Leiter, Jamie Arnold, and Carson Dorsey looking like he did this weekend. And more importantly, you don't have to go to so many arms in your pen. Mm. Would they have 13 guys pitch this weekend? Sounds about And I, I would guess two of them, three of them, Arnold, Dorsey, and Holtz were the ones that you would say were effective out of 13 of them. Well, obviously, when you're not having to play doubleheaders and when you have your most of your rotation back, you, you shorten that bullpen. You're shorten the, those guys aren't pitching in those moments. They're not pitching. So, I, I again, just like I kind of – it's weird, man. Just like I was after the Clemson game, this Clemson series, I'm like, man, they, they're, they're so the, – the, the good things about this team are really, really good. And the bad things right now, which is the bullpen – I think can be alleviated a little bit because there's hope on the horizon with Cam Leiter because he's going to eat up, you know, what do you have to get each each weekend? 81 outs, right? Well, Cam Leiter should theoretically eat up 18 of them. Well, now that's shortened your bullpen work by 18 outs. Like you saw those, maybe you didn't. I, hope, I pray you didn't. <laughs> but that game on Saturday night, man, they, they had nowhere to turn to get yeah, outs. Yeah. They just didn't. Um, and it'd be nice if they could throw strikes when they're not in, not not Dick Hauser. That'd be a good thing to see. But they the ones that did throw strikes got tattooed, so they just got some guys that are pitching in moments that they they probably don't need to be pitching in. But it's because of what's going on in the pitching staff right now. And if you saw what Wake Forest was doing, they were doing the same thing. Like they would bring in a guy, both like they brought in a guy in the eighth inning of a tied game that had like a six oh eight ERA. It's because they were out of pitching too. It's just their their guys made a few more pitches. Or in the case of that one Cam Smith at bat, uh, where the umpire just called three ball three ball pitches that were on the in the other batter's boxes strikes uh, that were unhittable. You know you get you get lucky with some umpiring calls or unlucky. Jackson West pops out with the bases loaded on ball four, where Cantu is coming up next. And Cantu then when he did bat the following inning he hit a home run. Well he maybe he hits a second grand slam of the game. And then you win the game. It comes down to those little moments. But overall, you still look at this team, right? Wake Forest is the number one team in the country to start the season. And uh, they're playing really well right now. And again, you should have probably swept the damn series. And I feel like if you have Cam Leiter, you definitely win the series. So that's good. That's good to see. Now you just hope Cam Leiter comes back soon. Yeah. Florida State, fifth in batting average, sixth in slugging, 13th in scoring. And 14th in fielding percentage. Yeah, those are all good things, right? Yeah. That's, those are all – That's and, and we're not two weeks into the season now. Yeah. We're through two-thirds of it. Uh, they've, they've, that's just – it's an elite offense with Cantu hitting like this. Uh, you, He's the last guy, I thought. Like, you'd like Ferro and Lodis to start hitting better too. But, man, they're eight, nine hitters. And they, they'll give you – so I think Lodi's had three hits in the first game on Saturday. Like, they're having their moments. Yeah. They haven't been great, but they're having their moments. And look at the look, look, look at what Wake had in their eight, nine hole. One guy hit 180, another guy hit 190. Like, Florida State's still good one through nine. They're not elite one through nine, but Faroe and Lodi's are – they'll they'll have some big hits throughout the year. Um, I don't even know where I was going with that. Other than you really do – Cantu being the guy now, he's your seventh hitter. And he hits the ball like that, mm. like he's just that's 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 a that's a lineup that just does not give you any breaks at all. Yeah, I think like Ferrer and, was batting fifth this weekend because Dingus is ahead of yeah, him. Yeah, they now, moved so. they moved Dingus to clean up and Ferrer to fifth. I don't know why they did that, but I didn't mind it. No, I just Dingus has been hitting better. But then no. Ferrer had the big, uh, really big home run on on Saturday to kind of break that game open in in the ninth inning. And then also, I you know look, this is just we talked about this beforehand, even before we saw the Grand Slam, but I don't know what's going on. <laughs> but 
what 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 you do? So if you guys didn't see it, Cantu hit a grand slam. Well, first off, Ferrer hit a two run homer in the ninth in the first game, and basically turned his back to first base and just started kind of strutting down to first base with his back turned. And then in the in the second game, Cantu hits a grand slam in the third inning, and starts talking smack to the pitcher as he's walking to first. Like, not, not talking to himself, like legitimately looking at the pitcher and talking to him. I guess I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. I didn't see his first at bat. I don't know if the pitcher said something to him, just like I don't know if the second baseman from Miami said something to Marco earlier in the series. I assume he did, and that's why they're talking like that. But by God, what, what you are doing when you do that, and by, do it. Have fun with it. You're up 5-1. When a team beats you, they are going to relish every moment of it when you act like that on the field. So if you can do it, you can back it up, and they have. What did you say their record is, 31-8? and eight? Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're good. They're a top-ten team in the country. But, you know, Wake Forest, they're, they're going to like – gonna, you're going to fire up the other team when you act like that. And if you're cool with that, which clearly they are, that's fine. But that comes with the territory uh, when you – I mean, just – it's like uh, Mad Max out there, man. <laughs> Just craziness. They need to have somebody in a guitar with a guitar, like just a, a just just going an electric guitar on the top of the dugout. It's just nuts what's going on. Oh man, um, you're right. It is. It's crazy. Uh, Duke, by the way, fresh off a series win at number twenty three Virginia Tech. So yeah, um, they'll be that was close. Uh, two games went to extra innings. Duke won the yeah. first one, lost the second one, and then won thirteen to ten on Sunday. So that's. That's usually what really good teams end up winning series when it gets to this point of the season. So Florida State will have their hands full. Uh, we'll see how it shakes out this weekend. Maybe you want to know how recruiting shook out this past weekend. Spring showcase, recruits on campus. How did it look? What do they think? Well, lucky for you, we got Michael Langston. He's going to break it all down for us right after this. It's uh, part of the Wake Up War Champ family. Michael Langston here to talk recruiting after a busy, busy weekend. Been a while. Michael in full go mode with the turtle right now. Michael, how's life? How are you? Uh, Mock, yeah, whatever. Uh, yeah, I'm good, man. Just a long weekend. A um, lot of coverage. Uh, certainly team stuff was incredible. I've read a lot of it, and Matt did an incredible job with recruiting, helping me out throughout the weekend. So it was, you know, it was pretty busy. Now we get to the really tax season with official visits in the summer. That's when it's going to get serious, going to get decisions. So, uh, yeah, let's do it. All right, we won't bother you too much about portal stuff. We might get to that on uh, maybe <laughs> yeah. a Wednesday live show, everybody. Tune in, perhaps. Perhaps is how it goes. Quarterback, obviously, everybody always looking at it, scrutinizing it. Everybody looking at DJ Uy Um Did pretty good, I thought. Um, yeah. Jamel Jones, though, remains kind of the crown jewel of the 25 class, at least when it comes to quarterbacks, right? Uh, what's the latest with Florida State and Tramel Jones? Yeah, um, visited this weekend. Um, he had previously visited Florida, which kind of ra raised my eyebrows because he hasn't really visited anywhere else. Um, you know, visit FSU. We should be talking to him, have a full update with him later. But, you know, I heard it clicked really well. I heard there's things that were really, uh, really good. The per it was very personable, as you would expect. FSU's made it clear that he's their guy. He, he He's the one they want. But there's a little rub, man. Uh, Florida is, is certainly caught his attention on that uh, last visit. And so I do think um, I do think they feel good about, you know, how he feels about them. But I think it's it's not totally done. I think it's something that's still up in the air that um, I think FSU fans are going to have to sweat it out of. You know, if they do have an official visit late in the summer, the big June 21st weekend with him. So I think uh, they're going to have to you know, finish it off because Florida is certainly making a push. I don't know if the reasons of going to Florida, uh, what specifically it had to do, whether it's Florida, whether it's a uh, you know, better chance to play early with FSU having some young guns like Brock and Luke in there that, hey, that could be a tougher chore. Or, you know, I don't know if it's like conference related where kids don't know where FSU is going to be. So I don't, I don't, there's, there's a lot of factors I'm waiting to, you talk to Tramiel, but uh, at the very least, um, he certainly, Florida's caught his attention, and um, I don't think it's as locked in as it was. 
Is there a name or two out there that might fill the the role if Tramel were to flip at some point, or is it too early to even talk and consider about that story? Well, thing? I think I think the guy if if they were gonna if they were gonna go after a, a new quarterback, which they're really not pushing for anybody, but if they did, I think it'd be Carter Smith, a four star quarterback out of uh, Bishop Vero, uh in state quarterback. Um, he's committed to Michigan, but he's the guy that FSU was on. Very, very solidly before uh, Tramel committed. So that's a guy that I think they would have some activity with. I know from a spring evaluation, like they do a lot of kids, they stop by that school. Now, wh- whether they talked, uh, whether they were there to see him or not, uh, I don't know. But um, he's the guy that I think if if there's a push, that would be probably the guy that they they would look into. I'm sure there's going to be others if that happened, but um, it's still too early to tell like multiple prospects of what, who they would go after. But this is the first time I got any sense that, okay, you know, it's a little bit of a threat there, <laughs> you know, with, with Tramiel. So it's an interesting development, but um, we'll see if FSU can close it out. Tramel Jones, six foot one eighty five, three star out of Mandarin High School in Jacksonville. Meanwhile, Carter Smith, six three one seventy five, as Michael said, out of Bishop Verone, Fort Myers, four star consensus guys. So who knows how that would work out? Let's keep it with the offense. Uh, all all star team name here, Osman Chroma. And I just you know can't judge life by uh, the cover of the book and all that or whatever. But just my guy just looks like a physical freak and a force on the football field. Uh, he's from Georgia. Uh, so you always got to have a little bit concerned there. Yeah. They're on the RPM meter as well behind Florida State, but Florida State ahead of the pack, you think? Lit at the top. Look at that, leading the leading the way in RPM. Yeah, I think it's it's still fairly open uh, as for even though that thing favors FSU. I think his family really likes FSU. Big O, as I call him, likes FSU a lot. He likes David a lot. Likes you know Norvell a lot. Obviously visited over the weekend. That went really well. He connects with Norvell. The family, like I said, loves them. I think I think Auburn, Georgia, Florida State, those are the main teams I hear. I hear some with Miami as well. That'll be a team. Those four, I think, are the teams I hear the most. And and then I went to see this kid like three, uh, at least two or three times. And what you aren't going to see all the time in these clips is he is an incredible uh, receiving back, like one of the best receiving backs, I think, in the country. Um, Lee County used him a lot in the passing game. Um, so I think overall from a total package, he has just about everything. Uh, and that was actually the game I was at, Colquitt. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just incredible talent. Um, certainly a guy that's going to officially visit FSU. I think June 7th is the date that I think he will see FSU officially. And um, just a guy that I think they need to keep chipping away of doing what they do with their backs. Because guy, when guys visit – Recruits visit that are running backs, they really are captivated by the way the usage of the backs and the way they're utilized in the different ways. Uh, it's very it's very versatile the way FSU does it. So I think that certainly captures his attention. I think FSU certainly you know, high on his list, and then they got a chance to really uh, set the tone when they get him an official visit on June seventh. Six foot, half inch, two ten. He's listed as so yeah, that'll hunt. Uh, this will also probably hunt too. They got options at running back, Michael Langston. Byron Lewis, strong program. Shot the Lee County as well, great program. But American American Heritage, a uh, bit of a gold standard in the state of Florida. Ohio right. State, Miami ahead of the Knowles and the RPM. But uh, I'm sure they made up ground this past weekend, no? Yeah, they've done a great job with him. I think those three teams are, are close. Uh, I, think, I actually think FSU is a little bit – higher than all of those uh, right now. Uh, I think uh, the connection with Sertain, uh, that's his former coach, um, really likes David Johnson a lot, really high on on what they do with their running backs. Uh, he just loves – he's been there several times. He just visited probably two weeks ago before this visit for the spring game. So I think he's a guy they certainly covet. They like a uh, great locker room guy, great player, great talent. Um, I think out of those two, I think – probably you see them take one and then and then later in the class probably take an athlete type and I'll cover that in my hot board uh coming up next week cheap plug there for the the hot board uh quarterback running backs that'll be up and I'll kind of explain that a little bit um next week but I think uh one of those two with Lewis or 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 Big O I think it will come down to just 
who they get and land. And I think that'll kind of be decided. It feels like sometime in the summer, because I think both of them are probably going to decide in the summer and you'll get some decision and some movement, uh, you know, where they go from there. Byron Lewis, uh, four star back six foot two Oh five. So Florida state has a type sounds like at least for this 2025 yes. cycle can never get too many offensive linemen Florida state, keeping their nose in the grindstone on that and, uh, throwing the net out far and wide going into the lone star state Lamont Rogers out of Mesquite, Texas horn high six, seven, three Oh five, all the big boys on yep. his recruiting profile. We see here LSU, Texas, Oklahoma, Texas A&M in the mix. How legitimate is Florida state's options possibilities with Mr. Lamont Rogers. Yeah, I think they're legit after this visit. Uh, just uh, it, always the first visit is the one you look of just the impact personally that they have with recruits because we know what Atkins does, you know, as far as offensive linemen, that's very attractive to people as far as development, that's attractive. So that part was there, but it's the personal connection. I think FSU did a really good job. Our Matt Lassier was one of the first to get up with um, Lamont right after uh, he stayed for a couple of days. He actually watched the spring game, then went to practice a little bit, uh, I think this afternoon while they're out there. And then um, Matt caught up him as he was leaving uh, the moment he was leaving. I think he's probably the first to get him, uh, you know, as far as that, that interview, but uh, really good stuff. Um, I, I do expect to fully expect uh, an official visit to FSU. I do think FSU LSU battle for what I hear Texas will, I'm sure, make a, a move, but uh, FSU and LSU, I think, are both teams that are very high on his radar, and it's it's not probably what you think. It'd just be about football. It's like the personal connection he has with those staffs, I think, is is really strong, and I think FSU certainly you know, made some waves as far as that visit. Certainly did what they wanted to accomplish, which is set the tone of the relationship, and then um, you know, the rest of the football stuff, I think, Lamont kind of got to see uh, for the spring game and even to practice probably. So I think it was more about, you know, that personal uh, bond and, and building and, and seeing just the players around these coaches and what they're like. I think that was a big deal for Lamont and his family. I like it. Big dude. State of Texas. Not a bad option when it comes to offensive linemen. Here closer to home, though, let's talk about a defender, somebody on defense, which looked great, I thought, on Saturday. And shoot, man, you know, Mike Norvell, Great offensive mind, but this Adam Fuller guy, he's cooking yeah. some stuff on the defensive side of the ball as well. Uh, Jalen Wiggins, hometown guy, Rickards High School here in Tallahassee, but a commit for the Florida Gators for right now. Uh, Georgia lurking possibly as well. Where's Florida State? Are they lurking as well? Uh, with well they're Florida? very lurking. Uh, they're they're more than lurking. They're moving up. Um, but uh, it's always been the most intriguing recruitment for me for the whole cycle because it's a local kid and in. The thing is, FSU was the first to really spot him. He's camped at FSU since he's like in ninth grade, um, plays at Tallahassee Rickards over there uh, with the Raiders. Shout out for the Raiders. Uh, but incredible talent, one that they've loved from the start. Great relationship with Coach JP and Norvell. I think, I think this weekend was more about just getting to know the person of not just Jalen, but getting to know the a person as far as the staff, the players, being around these people from a from an outside football standpoint. And I think that's what a lot of this visit was. And that's why I think uh, it was a really, uh, I think they nailed it. I think they nailed it with this visit. I think it was a big deal. I consider him a soft Florida commit. I don't think it's rock solid. I think it's one where FSU can pull this off. Now, early on, if people remember, I talked about how he's looking to get away from college, but I didn't hear that as much uh, over the weekend after this weekend. I was, it was less of that, you know, so it's more about what place do I feel like the connection is home. And so I think that was kind of the, the message and, and the messaging from FSU to kind of solidify that they already have official visit locked up. they will be the last official visit. So um, that's always a, a good thing, but I think really, from a personal standpoint, if you're looking for them to nail something, they nailed it with the relationships uh, this weekend where you got to know both sides personally and you got to know kind of what these people are at FSU with this staff. And I think as much time as he spent around them, you would think that's automatic, but I think uh, this was more um, really focused on that. 
you know, Jalen as a person and what you would mean, what you would mean in this, uh, you know, just this locker room and the people around it and the people you would be surrounded by, you know, so I think that was a big deal and, and certainly helped FSU because before that, all the other visits were about, Hey, we develop, we do this, we do that, but it was more so, Hey, we want, we want to know the person. And so that, I think that really resonated. Wiggins, 6'5", 235, defensive lineman, consensus four-star. find it interesting that, you know, you hinted that maybe the conference stuff, you know, the allure mm-hmm. of playing in the SEC might play a factor for Tramel Jones, but I wonder if Jalen Wiggins might be playing 3D chess and wondering, you know, what coach he might yeah. be playing for because yeah. uh, it might sound cool to play in the SEC, but probably sounds better to play for Mike Norvell when you know he's going to be the dude here for a long time and who knows how Florida's going to look in the next – five, right. six months, but that's pure speculation. Uh, one other thing to speculate about on the way out, Jeremiah Smith, man, would have been good if we could have got him. Uh, but what about <laughs> yeah. his teammate, Kobe Howard, uh, down there yeah. in Charlotte, another uh, talented wide receiver. Uh, his service is obviously hotly contested for uh, Florida State. Making any moves to uh, impress Mr. Howard? Yeah, Howard's been on campus a lot uh, for FSU. He's originally from the Pensacola area. Uh, I think moved out there to South Florida to play his – uh, junior and senior season. Um, he's a guy that he told me right after it's like FSU's on top. Um, I'm going to take it official um, in June and then probably decide in July. I think Miami, Florida have been the main teams that I've heard, you know, that are the main competition. Um, but I think this really, as long as is just about FSU giving him the green light. If he gets the green light, I think FSU is probably the desired spot. Um, but that's what we have to just wait on because they're after a lot of top guys. Dalen McCutcheon, uh, Kalik Lockett is another one. Uh, r- a lot of top guys that probably a little bit higher in the pecking order than he is. So that's why I think uh, the official visit will really tell us everything. That will tell you, okay, they 100% want him. There we go. Let's roll. So I think there's a lot of dynamics that go on with this recruitment um, that impact where it's Miami, Florida, or FSU. But I think if FSU gets in the green light, I, I think they'll be tough to beat. But that's kind of what we're waiting on. We're waiting on the portal as well. Um, yes. <laughs> Florida State had practice on Sunday, a bit of a walkthrough. We anticipate they're probably having exit meetings here on Mondays. You're listening to the program, everybody. So we'll, you know, by the time you're listening to this, there might be a guy or two that have jumped into the portal. Um, I don't know if there's a name or two that, that people should be on the lookout for. I know there's some really high hopes. The kid from UCLA, the linebacker from Tennessee, I don't know how real those are, Michael, right. but um, either, I don't know, man, you, you want to give me a two and a half over under, or do you just think that Florida State will, you're confident they're, they're not, they're going to add somebody. They're not just going to stand pat. I think wide receiver linebacker for me, uh, okay. defensive lineman, probably. Uh, those three positions for me are the the most coveted, especially receiver after what we saw yesterday. Um, but I think um, those those I don't really have names. I think Matt's all over that. Um, uh, Matt's like I <laughs> talked to Matt today, and he's like giddy as a schoolgirl waiting for this Sunday night uh, twelve o'clock to hit, and it's gonna be really rampant, guys. Like it's gonna pick up really fast, but. I think I said this to Matt too. I think there's already guys that while they couldn't talk to him because of the Atkins thing, uh, you know, that was a penalties. I think they already have some guys already lined up. And I think at this point, if it's Florida state and they're involved, I think these kids are going to wait and listen to them and, and go from there. But uh, I think there's going to be a lot of activity, but those three positions as I think are going to be the focus. All right. That was a lot of recruiting, everybody, but believe it or not, uh, there's so much more, and it's all over at the PRB, the Premium Recruiting Board. Subscribe to Warchant.com. You get all the great stuff from Corey and Ira and Gene. Uh, but then the PRB, man, you know, Michael, Matt, doing work for you folks, so go check that stuff out. Michael, thanks, as always, for your time. Uh, maybe we'll hang out on Wednesday. TBD. I'm with it. Whatever we got to do, let's do it. All right. Also, yeah, basketball, lost Jalen Worley but added Jerry Deng from Hampton, okay. who it wasn't a rhetorical question in the group chat, but his splits aren't that bad. Like he shoots like 46 from the field, 35 from three and 79 from the line, but only averaged 10 points. How is that possible? I Hey, you know, he's not getting a lot of shots. Maybe he I played guess. with somebody that averaged 25 a game yeah. and he didn't get a lot of chances to, uh, to take shots, but yeah, look, whatever. You, you can't look at this roster as it's currently constructed and think anything other than 
the team, the Florida State basketball team this year coming up is going to be worse than the one they had. I mean, it, but worse than the like two open. years ago, though. I mean, that's a, I, I don't, I don't know, man. I, who's on the team? Who's on the team that's proven that's done anything? <laughs> Jameer Watkins, Literally, I don't maybe know. he's still around. We don't know that. He hasn't announced. Maybe he is. I never got the impression he was a two-year guy, but he might be. And if he is, then awesome. But everybody, it seems like everybody else that played big minutes for this team that struggled anyway has left. And they have not exactly been funneling back through the portal, getting good players on the other side. So what is it? It closes May 1st, right? Isn't that what you said yeah. last week? Yeah. So they've got 10 days. So essentially 10 days to put together a team. Like you, you, it's going to be like uh, I don't know, it's just scrambling to put together a, a, just a team. It's like the uh, the uh, you remember the Scott Bakula football movie, the unnecessary roughness. Yeah, unnecessary. Yeah, necessary roughness. Yeah, Sinbad. Where they're just my guy. Yeah, Sinbad's yeah. in it. Uh, Kathy Ireland. Oh yeah. The the great great Kathy Ireland. Mm -hmm. I for my money, Aslan, the best of all time. Yeah, for sure. Sports Illustrated swimsuit model. I think she's the rain, best of all time. Rain in Spain. Like I. My mom's yeah. friend bought it for yep. us. Yeah, yep. highlight. Oh boy, I remember that one, man. Yep. So mm -hmm. it's a certain time in my life, yeah. in a young man's life. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, who else? Uh, Jason Bateman was in that. He was. You're All right. the greats were in that. Robert Loja was the coach. <laughs> it's a gr great, great. Hector flip. Elizondo was like the yeah. AD, I think. Right? No, he was the head coach. He was head Loja coach, was yeah. like the def defensive coordinator. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, John, was it John Candy? I can't remember who no, the announcer was. No, no, John Candy was the announcer for that baseball movie. But anyway, they're going from like. Oh, this guy, uh, Scott Bakula is like a farmer or something, or he goes and finds him. It's like, hey, you got some mar you got some throws left in that right arm? Is that what Leonard's doing? Is he driving around, like, finding some guy that was in the Navy for six years? I'm like, hey, man, you, you still got those hops? Want to give it one last run? Like, this is just – it's it's maybe all other college teams are like this too, and I just – we wouldn't know because we're not paying attention. But it seems like the portal right now is flowing one way. And all the good stuff is flowing away from Tallahassee. Not a lot of good stuff has flowed, flown, uh, flowed into it yet. But, again, 10 days. Ham's a closer. He Ham, is. He Ham's better be. He better be. Also, shouts to our guy Jeremy. I forgot. He was also at uh, Corner Pocket. I saw oh, yeah. I was scrolling up trying to find the, uh, the splits I sent to you guys. Forgot other people's names, but we appreciate everybody coming out for the meet and greet. Also, everybody that came out to hang out with Ira over – at uh, Hotel Indigo. Jeff Cameron, I think, was there as well. Gene Williams, yeah. I think, as well. So Probably, yeah, probably. Um, thanks for doing all that sort of stuff, hanging out with all of us and listening to the show again. Um, you think we might be slow because football is over, but wrong. Um, portal's open, so we'll yeah. continue to monitor that. We'll be dropping shows as needed. Also, baseball, softball, things still rock and rolling. Base, basketball, hopefully, uh, adding to the mix. So, don't go anywhere. Subscribe to the podcast, everybody. Subscribe to WarChant.com. Again, I think the promo code FSU1 is still active. Uh, two months, one American dollar. Who loves you? Hit the thumbs up on the way out. Would appreciate it. One to three o'clock, Jeff Cameron show. Thanks for listening to Wake Up WarChant. Presented by the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill.